It is a warm Saturday afternoon in a late Melbourne summer. as the turboprop Hercules lazily banks to the right. The shoreline we can see through the rear doors, some 1,500 feet below, is the western coast of Port Phillip Bay. It's just coming up to three o'clock in the afternoon, as several more young men dive into the cool waters of the bay. The eight men about to join them include a 29-year-old school teacher, a 23-year-old computer operator, an engineer in his mid-30s, a student under 21, and an unemployed 24-year-old truck driver. The men are Green Berets, Australian commandos, one of the hand-picked elite units of the Australian Armed Forces. However, Australia's commandos are weekend warriors. They're members of the Australian Army Reserve. And for all the things they'll do today, they'll pick up $22 before tax. In the weeks to come, these new recruits, or black berets as they're known in the regiment, will try to win their green beret. They will have to pass the army fitness tests and then meet the commando's own demanding standards. Two mile, nine mile and twenty mile runs in full kit and with a weapon. To carry a man of equal weight, and his weapon as well, a distance of 200 metres. And climb up a rope more than 6 metres, again with a weapon and webbing. And complete their basic infantry training. Tex Weston, Company Sergeant Major of 2 Commando in Melbourne, outlines their weapons. The type of weapons that you as commandos are expected to be proficient in at the end of your training. From your left, we have the M60 general purpose machine gun. It is a belt-fed, air-cooled machine gun that is capable of firing at a high rate of fire uh, at 550 rounds per minute. It fires a 7.62 round in a disintegrating belt. It has a range on the bipod of 550 metres and when attached to the tripod, is capable of firing to a range of 1,100 metres. The next weapon we have is the L1A1 SLR. This is the standard infantry rifle currently in use in the Australian Army. Its rate of fire is as fast as you can pull the trigger. The next weapon is the M16 automatic rifle. It was designed by the Americans and extensively used in Vietnam. It fires a 5.56 millimetre round and weighs 2.95 kilograms. The next weapon, the M203 grenade launcher. It is a breech loaded shoulder fired weapon and in the hands of a good user is capable of putting a, a grenade through a window at 200 metres.
the Mark V silent Sterling submachine gun. It weighs 3.6 kilograms and has a folding rear butt. The Browning self-loading pistol. What? This weapon is usually used as a secondary weapon or as a backup weapon. In the hands of a good user, it is capable of hitting targets to a range of 25 metres. The M72 short range anti-armour weapon. The 84mm Carl Gustav short range anti-armour weapon. It can fire a high explosive anti-tank round out to a range of 550 metres and is capable of knocking out any known tank. The M18A1 Claymore Mine. The M30 Grenade. Pick up a few skills for those times when they don't happen to have one of those weapons. become proficient handlers of small craft in a variety of conditions. The two-man kayak is rapidly giving way as the major commando amphibious vehicle to rubber duckies. The inflatable rescue craft of the surf lifesavers takes on a new meaning in the hands of skilled commando coxswains. Satisfactorily complete a roping and rappelling course on cliffs, first formed back in 1955. It's 30 years since the units which now comprise the 1st Commando Regiment were first raised. In fact, it's almost 31 years since I was first told that I was to raise and form the 1st Commando Company in Sydney. I returned to Australia at the end of November 1954 after service in Korea and Japan where my last appointment had been uh, second in command of the 1st Commonwealth Division Battle School at a place called Haramura near Hiroshima in Japan. After a few days on leave, I wandered into what was then Headquarters Eastern Command in Victoria Barracks in Sydney and saw a friend of mine and said, any idea what my next appointment is to be? And he said, yes, you are to raise and form the 1st Commando Company. 
And I said, well, that's a good joke. Now, what am I really going to do? And he said, no, that's for real. That's it. And uh, I finally accepted it. But of course, at that stage, uh, I had no idea that the Australian Army was even contemplating uh, re-raising commando units. This is the story of a group of peacetime civilians in uniform. Civilians who give their spare time to developing the skills of the professional soldiers. This is a Saturday morning parade by the men of the 1st Commando Company at George's Heights, Sydney. The commanding officer of the company, Major William Harold Grant, a regular officer, trains every commando to be the kind of soldier he's always been himself. Since that first parade in 1955, all commando recruits have been civilian soldiers. Reservists, training on weekends and Tuesday nights. A tradition of some 30 years of service. Of all walks of life, amongst them are doctors, lawyers, clerks, salesmen and tradesmen. Every one of these men has been selected only after a successful interview with a commanding officer. This is a company of specialists. Specialists in the cool, audacious type of fighting which the commando is emotionally fitted to undertake. I reported into Victoria Barracks in February or March of 1955 where I was given an office and I got on with the task of interviewing people uh, prior to forming the unit. We had been given uh, quite a degree of publicity in the media and some idea of the types of training that the unit would undertake had been contained in this publicity. Uh, the fact that all ranks would be required to be qualified parachutists, that we'd do diving, we'd do canoeing and so forth so that intending applicants had some idea uh, as to what they'd be required to do. Volunteers from civilian life with no previous service experience are taught the basic essentials of soldiering in a special trainee squad. This squad very quickly becomes familiar with the service rifle during a concentrated course of drill instruction and weapon training. The company sergeant major, also a regular soldier, the regiment has always enjoyed the highest ratio of regular officers and NCOs to reservists in the Australian Army, an indication of the importance of training. The commando must keep himself physically fit, and gymnastic exercises are a prelude to training in unarmed defence, at which every man must be adept. The volunteer for enlistment in the commando units in Melbourne and Sydney must be between 18 and 30 years of age. He should possess the intermediate certificate, or its equivalent, as the minimum standard of education. He must be physically fit and should possess the right mental outlook to qualify him for commando training. He must volunteer for overseas service in time of war and must be able to swim. He should also be currently engaged in some other active sport. Time now to put some of the lessons learned into practice during an exercise simulating an operation which would be routine work for fully trained commandos. The men are thoroughly briefed by Major Grant. The exercise will involve the cooperation of the Royal Australian Navy and the Royal Australian Air Force. Within the submerged submarine, Polemicus, the commando party is further briefed by a section leader. The submarine captain adjusts the periscope and the section leader is able to observe at first hand and study the coastline where he and his men expect to land. The canoes which have been stowed in the forward compartment of the submarine are stood up through the torpedo loading hatch where sailors are ready to help launch them. The men staging the raid some 30 years ago were all members of the citizen military forces. They spent more time earning a living than they did as soldiers. And each of them went through the training and testing necessary to win their Green Beret. This series will follow young men in Melbourne and Sydney as they attempt to follow in their footsteps some 30 years later in their quest to win their Green Berets. That raid was filmed during the very first year of the re-establishment of the commandos in 1955. What do the commandos do in 1985? A question put to the current boss of the Australian commandos, Lieutenant Colonel Philip Gould. First commando regiment was formed on the 1st of February 1980 formation of this regiment drew together what were three formerly independent subunits. First Commando Company in Sydney, Second Commando Company in Melbourne and 126 Signal Squadron in Watsonia in Melbourne. The regiment forms part of what is known in the Australian military as the Special Action Forces. Special Action Forces consists of a directorate in Army Office in Canberra, the well-known Special Air Service Regiment in Perth and one Commando Regiment. Both the Special Air Service Regiment and One Commander Regiment have associated signal squadrons. 
the formation of Commando Regiment and its place in the Special Action Forces has allowed clear delineation between the Special Air Service Regiment and the Commandos in the tasks that they are to carry out. It must be understood that the Special Air Service Regiment generally operate in very, very small groups. Their main task is reconnaissance and surveillance behind enemy lines. Commandos, what we're on about, they're operating in large groups as a raiding force. In other words, we will go behind enemy lines in groups from 50 to 400 men and we will destroy enemy installations, destroy enemy property and the enemy himself and so in so doing destroy his will to wage war. The development of the Special Action Forces concept in 1980 gave the commandos a clear-cut role as raiders to go behind enemy lines, destroy installations and make their way back. A crystal clear direction for future training. Basic infantry skills are held to be as equally important as the more exotic areas of parachuting, roping and small craft handling. A lot of training for a reserve unit. The commando regiment also serves as a human storage system for specialised skills. The Commando Regiment allows the Defence Force to keep certain specialist skills alive. And although many of these skills are, of course, uh, used and utilised in the Special Air Service Regiment, it's necessary for us to have, even at Army Reserve level, people who can uh, climb, uh, technically climb cliff faces, uh, roping, rappelling, the use of small boats under very, very arduous conditions, and, of course, even work above the snow line. We must remember that uh, a fairly large percentage of Australia is covered by snow in a few months of the year in, in winter. So we must make sure that at least a small element within the Defence Force is familiar with conditions above the snow line. And it's for this reason that we conduct some training during the winter months in the snowy mountains. And this training is not uh, merely orientated towards uh, skiing, cross-country skiing and so on. There are survival aspects, the building of snow shelters. All of this is combined with an advanced level of technical climbing. The regiment does have the responsibility towards the regular army for training in diving and we train uh, people from the engineers, uh, people from the armoured corps in diving skills. We train a lot of people from the regular army in climbing skills and we also conduct in many of our amphibious courses in uh, use of small boats and the use of canoes and so on we also train many many people from the regular army in these skills as well being the keeper of that sort of knowledge also imparts a certain responsibility in the area of training of other army units the commandos boast the highest ratio of regular officers and NCOs of any unit in the reserve. What sort of men make up this commando regiment in 1985? Typical of the Green Berets would be Bob Randall, a fireman with the Department of Aviation. Bob is a senior non-commissioned officer. He is probably a touch older than most. This doesn't prevent him from spending his weekends a little more energetically than most of his workmates. This series will look at a group of new recruits as they try to win their Green Berets, meeting people like Jim McMillan, a clerk with the Department of Aviation. Jim McMillan will try to complete his 20 mile run in the allotted time of four hours. Well, I try and average between 70 and 100 kilometres per week. And it's usually split up between uh, day on, day off. Uh, but over the weekend, it's pretty intensive. And I try and get up, up to three 10-mile runs in over that time. John Haywood typifies the appeal of the Green Beret. John won his first green lid over 20 years ago. A recent divorce, no kids at home, and John's chasing a second green hat. I'm divorced, uh, got no ties anymore. I wanted uh, 
get back to the comradeship of the guys and the challenge and uh, a lot of the things that you can do in the unit, such as uh, jumping out of aeroplanes, um, a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, return for it. Though. Stephen Flaherty is a 22-year-old student. Stephen always experienced a little fear of heights. We'll see Stephen tackle it in the most positive way possible. Probably the rope climb. Yeah, there's a there's a bit to do with roping and rappelling, and uh, I'm not too, you know, I'm a bit worried about the rope. <laughs> Peter Macris is even younger. He's a high school student. His intention to win his Green Beret doesn't sit that well with some of his friends at school. He caught a bit of flack off it for a couple of people, but generally, you know, most people say, oh yeah. You know, some people are pretty interested, they want to know what, you, what you're doing and that sort of stuff, but others, you know, they just don't really, don't really care, or some they like to give you a bit of, put a bit on you and they say things like that, you know, they say, oh, commandos, and they go on here, you know, and they, they start up with, you know, they start saying, yeah, do 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 and they go on with you like that, you know, or you want someone coming, oh, I'm a soldier or something like that, you know. I really like that, it sounds really interesting. And of all the guys I've talked to, they thought it was really good. And I've had a other couple of people, I've had a few people tell me, well, parachuting's better than sex, so I'm looking forward to it. These and the other men we'll come to meet are willing to suffer incredible interruptions to their private lives and push their bodies to limits they didn't know existed to try to win a piece of green wool with a fake leather trim. Just what is the attraction of the Green Beret? A question put to those who won the first Australian Green Berets 30 years ago. The night I got the Green Beret, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a dream. There were over 160 blokes on the intake in two platoons, and of that 160, 19 blokes qualified for the Green Beret. And I just just could not believe it. Um, I have a, a brother who was in SAS, another brother who was in the Army, another one in the Air Force, and I think they could, they just, they didn't believe that uh, I could have passed all those tests and, and got the beret. And, you know, to this day I often look back and think, maybe it was a dream, it didn't happen, I, I, I couldn't climb those cliffs or run that scramble or five mile run or jump that trench or carry a mate a hundred metres, and, you know, but we did it. As the uh, RSM of the unit, that stage, uh, Warrant Officer Curl um, told me on my first uh, indoctrination of the unit that the Green Beret was achievable and uh, that all one needed to achieve that was uh, a little bit of courage and, uh, and self-discipline. And uh, I found that uh, all the self-discipline I've gained uh, as a younger person came out of this unit. And uh, certainly it stayed with me for all my life, both professionally and as a soldier. Having won the Green Beret, it changes a man's attitudes for the rest of his life. It's not like being a member of the winning football team and forgetting it some three years later. I mean, it was all, it was all tough. Uh, it took 10 months from the time you joined till the time you got your Green Beret. And I remember one particular speed march the, uh, when we were out doing a five miler and uh, I think nearly two thirds of the, the group dropped out and it was a stinking hot day. And, uh, it really was. Uh, I think we all finished up with blisters because we were all fairly new and all had fairly new boots and uh, we thought that was just about the end. But I enjoyed it. The fact that it was, was tough was basically why I joined. I mean, it was a unit that did everything. We were all 18, 19, 20, in our early 20s. We had that vitality, that youthfulness, the exuberance of youth. The thing that you lose when you get to 35, you look back now, I look in the mirror at myself in the morning now, and you go, yuck. But when you're 18 and you're tight as a drum, you're so physically fit, you're bursting out of your skin, and you can just do such remarkable things. There were so many young chaps, the cream of youth. 18, 20-year-old youth just bursting with energy. Actually, I can remember being away on camp, and we were waiting for a war to start in those days. We were really busting for something to get... 
I, looking back now, it's rather stupid. But we were waiting for something so we'd get out and do something. But attitudes have changed. Well, I wasn't real keen on raping. It's like hard work to me. And uh, if I could get out of it and drive a truck, I used to. As far as the raping was concerned, the parachuting I really enjoyed. And, uh, and uh, the unarmed combat courses that were run here, I did a few of those. I was, ended up an instructor doing that. And I don't believe that we were as fit as the lads are today. I don't go for this garbage about not like they were in my days. Doesn't mean a thing. Well, in that 40-year period of time, I would say there's been very little change. To me, he is still the same style of lad as what I was when I was 18 and 19 years of age when I went away. In this 30th anniversary year, just how many of these new black berets will get to exchange them for green? You know, when they get their green lid, they're pretty happy with them. You know, a lot of guys prefer to leave the unit rather than lose it. It's a pretty important thing. personally and I'd hate to have to lose it so I'll certainly try a lot to keep it. Cool. 